an unprecedented international health emergency never seen before in the history of mankind. A global pandemic that has taken the world by storm. More than 1.3 million people infected with the coronavirus worldwide. More than 74,000 dead so far in 200 countries and territories. COVID-19 has led to a human tragedy of unimaginable proportions. It has also caused massive economic disruptions amid the colossal public health disaster. When will the world come out of this scourge? Is the global economy now facing the deepest recession in history? It all started late last year. That was when the COVID-19 virus first jumped from animals to humans in a wholesale seafood market in the Chinese city of Wuhan. Since then, the virus has killed thousands and infected hundreds of thousands, causing human devastation on a scale never seen since the days of the bubonic plague and the Spanish flu epidemics in the previous centuries. The pandemic has now spread across the globe, forcing governments to impose lockdowns, curfews and other emergency measures to contain its spread. Apart from the health crisis, the total costs of the economic disaster are incalculable. Flights have disappeared from nations' skies. The hospitality industry is in doldrums and with supply chains thoroughly disrupted, the world is now staring at an economic crisis of immense proportions. The economic impact is tremendous. The economic impact is going to be massive. We haven't seen this before. It is unprecedented. The fact that the virus first hit China, known as the factory of the world, deepened the crisis. As the epidemic erupted in late January, China first imposed an immediate lockdown in Wuhan and factories extended their Lunar New Year holidays. Supply chains were disrupted and the Chinese economy took a major hit. We've seen the, the, the very severe impact in terms of China's economy. Uh, the most recent economic data that we've seen on China suggests that in the first two months of this year, China's economy effectively came to a standstill. So that has had knock-on effects throughout the rest of the region, through supply chains being disrupted, through disruption to Chinese demand as well, because China is now a major export market for a lot of countries in the region. Unfortunately, the disease broke out in, uh, in Wuhan, which is a very key logistics and delivery center for China in that sense. And that resulted in a complete disruption of the global supply chain. And of course, China being one of the biggest exporters and manufacturers, uh, economic activity was impacted uh, very, very badly. Though not typical of a virus that has just jumped from animals to humans, it is transmitting at an alarming rate, infecting hundreds of thousands across the world. An average person with the infection can pass it on to several others, and its mortality rate is also far higher than the seasonal flu. The combination of the virus's ability to spread quickly and cause serious illness has led to uncertainty and panic. China took the brunt first, with some 83,000 cases so far and more than 3,300 deaths. This particular outbreak was uh, first, uh, seems to have first started in November last year, 2019, although in the earliest cases it was not recognized as an outbreak but by early December it was recognized that there was an unusual pneumonia that was uh, circulating in, in Wuhan. Um, many of the patients associated with one particular seafood market so that triggered an investigation uh, and that's how the whole investigation into the outbreak started. But life now in Wuhan, the original epicenter of the pandemic, is slowly returning to normal. New infections and deaths have disappeared, 
and many of the victims are taking the ordeal in their stride. 19-year-old student Miss Liu did not panic at all when she had the virus. She, in fact, was expecting to be infected since her mother got it earlier. And finally, both of them were admitted to hospital. Actually, 落到地上去了，就那种感觉，就是觉得得救了，就是在我们在我们看来，只要有筹谋有意愿，就是就是就就是一个很大的希望。Upon her, 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 her recovery, Miss Liu felt odd when she suddenly found herself inside a stadium turned into a quarantine facility. 我是跟差不多一千个人。住在一起，认识一个体育馆改造的一个。当时那个体育馆在一月份的时候，我还去现场看过演出，然后到了二月份的时候，我是二月十六号晚上进去的。嗯，很魔幻，就一个月的时间，就发生了这么多事情。所以
这么大的疫情没有超出我们原来的想象，当时我们也有很多危机的处理的这种预案和方案，但是这个疫情影响确实范围比较大。那主要是影响的范围是这样的，就是开始呢，这个之前的阶段是中国的主机厂，然后供应链受到很大的影响。那本来是到接下来是中国的主机厂在逐步恢复，然后呢，接下来是海外的主机厂受到一些影响，和供应链都受到一些影响。MIM has drawn up an emergency response plan and is trying to cope with the crisis as best as it can. Being a large group with several units across the nation, it has so far managed to avoid layoffs. To now, we are affected by the company's impact of about 10 to 20. But we have not yet planned the production plan because we are in the internal because we are in the internal because we are in the internal. 然后有些行业、有些工厂的营养范围不一样，那我们人员在内部进行调调动，呃，有的工厂忙的，那把人调动到工厂忙的地方，所以人员还在调调整当中，这是一个。Apart from big corporations such as Mins, small businesses have been severely hit as well. 68-year-old Ivy Lai started her own stage productions company nine years ago and was doing well. Her company's turnover went up from 90,000 Hong Kong dollars in the first year to 3 million Hong Kong dollars in 2017. Then, the nightmare scenario emerged. We have a time time, all of them are filled up. It's been a year, and then it's been a year. At the end of the year, it's been a year, and then it's been a year, and then it's been a year. 但係咧喺年廿幾時已經開始開始話出事啦嘛，香港或者誒有有有疫情啦，就之前都有聽過嘅，但係就大大陸嗰度傳出嚟話有有啲有啲疫疫情啊咁樣，但係香港政府就冇乜嘢用，跟住咧就誒年廿幾開始開始就緊張啦，結果咧我係今年嘅年初一係二月一月廿五號，好似年初一，我收到嗰啲客嘅電話啦。本來我 cut 啦 cut 啦 cut 啦，佢全部啲 job 咧話俾我聽停啦停啦，我唔做啊！因為年初一林鄭月娥即係政府咧喺電台宣布嚇啊疫已經確認咗有疫情啦咁樣，同埋咧我哋嗰啲誒誒康文署嘅場地都會閂。佢喺毫無預防之下一講咧，所有客人嗰啲 job 都 cut 曬。我二月份咧總共有廿五個 job。The pandemic has sent the world economy into uncharted territory. The virus has now spread from China to other parts of the world, especially Europe, where it's leaving behind a trail of death and economic collapse. Italy, Germany, Spain and France, some of the biggest European economies are shell-shocked from the ensuing human and material devastation. How long will this spectre haunt the entire world? April 2020, more than three months after the novel coronavirus was first identified by China's health authorities on December 31st, 2019. China today seems to be getting the virus under control, but the spectre is now haunting the rest of the world. The epicenter of the pandemic has shifted from the east to the west. The U.S. has now overtaken China in terms of the total number of infections, some 370,000 cases and 11,000 deaths so far and rising. After the U.S. comes Europe, where Italy has now become the new epicenter with over 133,000 infections and some 17,000 deaths. It's followed by Spain with 137,000 cases and more than 13,000 deaths. They are followed by Germany, with some 104,000 cases and almost 2,000 deaths. And France, with almost 100,000 cases and some 9,000 deaths. In Asia, Iran has so far bore the brunt of the disease, with
with some 60,500 cases and some 4,000 deaths. But the situation in Europe is dire indeed. There are still no signs of the epidemiological curve flattening. That is, after a peak, there is no gradual slowdown and an eventual plateau. Especially in Italy, uh, was particularly severe. Uh, but now it is spread into other countries. Spain uh, is uh, actually recording an increase in numbers of uh, registered uh, cases. Uh, Germany is also uh, uh, now uh, uh, at the center of the of the contagion, and uh, it is gradually spreading throughout Europe and also elsewhere. One reason why the virus spread rapidly to Europe was that the continent was slow to react to the outbreak in China. And as a result, experts say they were caught off guard. Probably at the beginning there was some uh, uh, undervaluation of the situation because uh, it started in China, uh, but uh, Italy probably didn't uh, take advantage of the time lag between uh, the China outbreak and the outbreak in Italy to learn, because this is a learning experience. I think countries should learn from the countries that got uh, uh, the disease before and how to deal with that. So initially there was some uh, uncertainty and uh, so uh, even policy measures were not fully clear. But then the government uh, uh, took uh, uh, the responsibility and the leadership of, uh, of deciding what to do and uh, there was initially a lockdown of some areas, which was already a sizable uh, uh, economic impact because these areas are the most productive, the, uh, the wealthier region in Italy, North, Northern Italy. And then, of course, the situation didn't stop and uh, continued to spread. So the government had no choice but to effectively lock down the whole country. <laughs> Now, the European economic engine has come to a virtual halt. Of the eight countries that account for more than 50,000 cases of COVID-19, five are the largest economies of Europe and also among the biggest in the world. Still, at this point in time, it is not possible to assess the full impact of the disease in Europe. It really depends on the infrastructure and the ability of governments to actually to mobilize the entire economy. Uh, in, in, in the Chinese example, you saw that it could move very, very quickly, right? So they locked down the city, the entire province of like 65 million people within a matter of like two days. And they were very, very effective in enforcing the lockdown itself. Um, in Europe, you have problems with that because of the fact that it's a European Union, you have freedom of movement, freedom of labor, freedom of capital across all countries. So enforcing that, within Europe itself is going to be a lot more difficult. Where European infrastructure is concerned, with the, perhaps the exception of some of the northern European countries, infrastructure in the other European countries is not up to the kind of standards that we would think they should be. If you have a weak link in your infrastructure where healthcare is concerned, it will be exposed, and not only will it be exposed, it will be multi multiplied uh, uh, many times over. The economic impact is going to be massive because if you think about the uh, downturn that was already in place at the end of last year, that was basically the result of trade wars and, uh, um, and uh, collapsing confidence, lack of investment and so forth. Italy was already contracting, the Italian economy was already contracting at the end of last year. I think Italy uh, has been severely hit uh, and, uh, and it's going to be, uh, and probably the impact is going to be in the order of 10%, uh, again, uh, in the first uh, two quarters of this year, uh, uh, overall, okay, cumulative. And, uh, and then there will be some recovery in the second half. So the overall outcome for the year, I think, is because between minus 6 and minus 8% for Italy. Uh, the rest of, the, of Europe depends how the situation unfolds. But at the moment, it looks like it will be as severe as in Italy. So uh, my guess is that the same uh, magnitude uh, will apply to other European countries and overall for Europe. The moment you have lockdowns in an economy, the economic impact is going to be huge. And there will be companies that will go bankrupt. There will be airlines that go bankrupt. 
there will be people losing their jobs. And Europe is several weeks, if not months, behind where China was. So you're probably now in Europe talking about a period that's going to take you through at least until the end of May before you start seeing some form of recovery and some form of return, return to normalcy in the economies. Though the virus has impacted nearly all industries, some are facing a more serious threat than others. One of them is the airlines and travel sector. Tens of thousands of flights vanish from the skies in weeks, impacting already struggling economies. From late January to the middle of February, daily departures and arrivals for domestic and international flights in China dropped to just 2,000 from some 15,000. Chinese travelers account for about 20% of all tourism spending, according to the UN World Tourism Organization. For Happy Star Travel Agency in Hong Kong, the outbreak came as a double shock since it happened on the back of street protests that had already dented tourist arrivals in the territory. Joyce Fung, manager of the Happy Star Travel, hadn't seen business so bad even during the SARS epidemic. Now, most travelers have canceled their tickets or have postponed their plans. Yek 那就我們發覺在一月的時候 the restrictive measures adopted by China and other nations have helped delay the spread of the virus. But the nation's increasing isolation could have lasting economic consequences as well. Economies are shrinking, and it will take months to get back to normal once the virus subsides. Asia has also been virtually locked down, with countries adopting emergency measures, both economic and social, to halt the spread of the disease and pull the economies back. Will these measures work? On March 12, 2020, the World Health Organization, or WHO, declared COVID-19 a global pandemic. Since then, the virus has spread to around 200 countries and territories, and tens of thousands are dead outside China. Manufacturing, trade, consumption, production and the movement of people have been greatly affected and in many cases halted. The economies in Southeast Asia have been especially hit hard since all of them are closely linked with China. There was a lot of dependence upon trade with China, either trading to China or taking goods from China to feed factories in the system in Southeast Asia. So the impact was already being felt. China was closing down and shutting down. Trade for ASEAN was already falling through the floor. So that's a big problem. The region itself, I think Singapore has been tackling the virus extremely well. They're on top of it from the very beginning. They've been taking measures. The contract tracing here is probably the best in the world. Um, it helps being a smaller country, actually with good systems in place and learning from previous experiences. The rest of Southeast Asia now is playing catch up. And I think a lot of them didn't quite believe how bad it could become. 
or didn't quite believe that it was going to be a big issue. So someone like in Indonesia has been pretty slow at reacting, and now he's gearing up. 44-year-old Calvin Sim is the head of a Singapore-based semiconductor equipment maker, WF Industrialopolis. The company has supply chains across China and other nations in Asia. Just like everyone else, Sim was caught totally unawares by the sudden outbreak in Wuhan or how damaging that could be for his company. Things took a dramatic turn for the worse just overnight. His order book, which was overflowing last December, went to zero in two months. Before the new year, in fact, um, towards the second half of last year, we were getting inquiries um, for budgets to be approved um, beginning this year or after Chinese New Year. Everybody was uh, pushing towards the first quarter of this year. But all these inquiries started to have delays in approval because um, when January came, um, December, January, when the thing hit, or everybody was, it was in chaos, um, to, to be honest. Millions of dollars have been uh, held up uh, in terms of purchase orders because of this virus. From January onwards till uh, the Chinese New Year period and till now, there has been zero inquiries. Sim, who has 38 employees in his small-scale enterprise, has still managed to keep his head above water, at least for now. Employees have been asked to work from home, and none has been asked to leave. So far, fortunately for ourselves, uh, we've been good. Um, no layoffs, no job losses, just a, f a one or two um, Hit, hit with the stay-home uh, notice um, or quarantine measure. Um, they were travelling previously. Uh, when they came back after the Chinese New Year, they had to be quarantined for 14 days before they come to work. Um, that disrupted my, my, my operations. And, and besides that, I think um, everything is still intact. But the reality is, the economic contagion is spreading just as fast as the disease itself. Governments in the region are now scrambling to mitigate the impact of the crisis. Singapore has unveiled another 3.6 billion US dollars in stimulus package to soften the economic damage from the ongoing coronavirus outbreak. Together with the previous two packages, it has now set aside almost 42 billion US dollars or around 12% of its GDP to help businesses and households tide over the month-long partial lockdown and stem the surge in COVID-19 cases. We've downgraded Singapore to a recession as well. We expect Singapore's growth to come in at about minus 7% this year. Other Southeast Asian nations are also facing a deep economic crisis. Malaysia has also announced an economic program to cushion the impact of COVID-19. Among others, the stimulus package comprises special allowances for healthcare providers, one-off cash aid, and microcredit scheme for small and medium-sized enterprises. It will also be used to support businesses and strengthen the country's economy amid all the uncertainties as a result of the pandemic. Thailand has also unveiled a stimulus package worth $17.6 billion to lessen the impact of the pandemic. Still, the economic scenario does not look rosy for the region as a deep recession looms. We believe that uh, where, where Malaysia and Thailand are concerned, we would like to see anywhere between minus uh, 4 to minus 5% growth. In Thailand's case, it's because unfortunately the country is also going through its worst drought in 40 years. So that has actually affected the incomes of the rural population. And that means that consumption has actually come off the cliff. Second reason is that um, the electronic sector was still not recovering from the trade dispute that the US had with China last year. And that also affected Malaysia and Singapore, Korea and Taiwan, the electronics manufacturing uh, heart of this part of the world. So electronics manufacturing was also pretty much in the doldrums. Thirdly, the auto sector in Thailand also collapsed last year because the world 
right now is not buying combustion engines. Now you have the COVID-19 affecting the economy via tourism. Tourism as a percentage of GDP is about 25% of the Thai economy. Uh, and as a multiplier, it has a huge multiplier effect uh, for the other parts of the economy as well. So you have no tourism, you have a depressed auto sector, depressed electronic sector, you have the worst drought in 40 years. Put that all together, the Thai economy is really, really struggling as a result of that. The stimulus measures are substantial for the time being. But governments might be called upon to do even more if the situation doesn't turn for the better in the near term. The Singapore budget is about targeting 2.1% of GDP in deficits. Um, if you think about it, if you're going to be shut down for six months eventually, it's half the yearly GDP. And so those measures were not going to be enough for now. And I do, I do see governments having to do more if the shutdown is going to be that long. So that's a, probably a downside scenario to be had. Um, there will be a repricing of uh, government budgets again. Uh, they need to do more. I think governments will try and look at pumping in more money, but they've got to try and make sure that, that money they're pumping into the system is reaching every part of the system. Um, and there's a question mark around, is that really going to happen? Now, we saw with the previous financial crash, you know, they were in, they were bailing out banks. But people you know, further down the, the economic chain weren't receiving the benefit of that. For this crisis, it's different. And they've got to be aiming you know, to get the money down to the ordinary man on the street who's running a small business or looking after smaller businesses. Calvin Sim, for one, is glad that the government has come in with a stimulus package to ease the difficulties faced by many companies and self-employed persons who are having immediate cash flow problems. They're helping us uh, here and there, um, whether it's a little or, or more, but um, I see that they are, they are putting in the effort. Um, number one, with this uh, Malaysian uh, border lockdown, with these guys that we have that needs to be accommodated in Singapore, um, they are providing a, a $50 um, subsidy for per day per worker. And I, I mean, it's, it, it's not going to subsidize the whole, you know, the whole amount, but I think it's a good gesture on there and, and, and something that uh, Singapore government recognises that industries uh, needs, um, the industry like us needs, right? And um, second thing is um, I see that um, they are working with the banks uh, for loan approvals um, and backing the banks to, to give out loans to the various companies um, in, the, in the different industries. And that's something that, that I think that, you know, that would help tide some of us through, you know, SMEs through this difficult time. The virus is causing massive disruptions across the world. People are staying at home, avoiding travel and shopping as much as possible, reducing demand for consumer goods and energy. Factory shutdowns have also curtailed production and disrupted supply chains. Still, some economists are hopeful that the current level of disruption could be managed if the number of new virus cases begins to slow and China's factories reopen soon. The result will be a dent in the Chinese economy in the first quarter with a marginal impact on global growth. But if the virus continues to spread, it may force large parts of the economy to go into hibernation. If that happens, the world may be looking at an economic damage far worse than previously imagined. China, 
where the virus originated, is picking up the pieces after the pandemic swept across Wuhan city and Hubei province. Factories are slowly opening and supply chains are getting restored. The country has also reported a flattening of the virus curve, even if it hasn't been able to halt the spread of the deadly disease completely. The fact is, the COVID-19 pandemic has exacted a heavy toll on the country's economy and finances. Analysts have predicted that the GDP growth of the world's second biggest economy could sink to just 1% or 2% this year, compared to 6.1% last year. Coming out of the nightmare scenario, the challenge ahead for China is nothing short of monumental. Will it still be able to move towards realizing its China dream as envisioned by President Xi Jinping in 2013? Will it still emerge as a prosperous and dominant global power? I would say do not um, underestimate the ability of the Chinese to be able to come up from this one. I would think that comparing this to the rest of the crisis that they've been through, this is probably you know, the least uh, painful in that sense because of the fatality that they saw was nothing. Six million people were killed during the Cultural Revolution. This was just, you know, a few thousand people. So they will be able to move on relatively quickly. And on top of that, they have the fiscal firepower to utilize if they want to. And infrastructure today is far more resilient, They're a lot more modern, and, you know, they're a lot more um, uh, 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 forward-thinking as well. And it will still exist. There may be some delays, there may be some hiccups, there may be some repositioning in terms of policy going forward but they will think about this and they will be planning for, for all eventualities as a result. So the Chinese dream, I don't believe, will be dashed. But it may not be business as usual in China after COVID-19, at least for the near term. And for many other countries which are heavily linked to it economically. Analysts believe these countries and businesses will learn valuable lessons from the crisis. Their reliance on China has exposed many of their shortcomings. Many of them are left in the lurch, following the massive disruptions to business and supply chains. That was what happened to Kelvin Sim. His company suffered a huge setback when supplies of materials and components scheduled to arrive from China failed to reach their destination following the outbreak. For China, we have manufacturing partners to provide the materials, basically for graphite, tungsten, ceramics and some plastics. They have been hit for a couple of weeks before the Chinese New Year period till um, I would say uh, middle to end February. But um, their manufacturing were running at maybe 50% utilization. Um, that affected some of our supplies coming in to, from there and affected our uh, supplies to our, our, our customers as well. So, but what we did was to uh, purchase enough to tide us through um, more than maybe two months or three months worth uh, of parts for our customers. And, um, and so far, it's still manageable, but if another big storm hits again, um, we wouldn't know. Analysts believe that the only way to get around the problem is by diversifying production facilities and supply chains and not source a large chunk of their goods and materials from China. This is uh, true in terms of global supply chains. It's also true uh, domestically. Uh, in other words, you have to put in place contingency plans at company level uh, to try to avoid uh, any such uh, situations like the one we are, we are in right now. Uh, although I have to say that, that this is really unprecedented, the next crisis will be different. So, you know, it's, it's, it's always uh, very difficult to, uh, to put in place measures to cover and to uh, be ready to respond to any crisis in the future. Even before COVID-19 struck, the US and China were already involved in a bruising trade war that had not only taken a toll on the economies of the two nations, but also on the entire global economy as well. 
But just as Washington and Beijing reached a phase one trade deal in January, the virus struck, wiping off all the expected gains from the easing of trade tensions between the two largest economies. I think that has the impact of lowering growth. Um, if not for the trade dispute, growth would have been at about 6.8 to 7 percent. But because of the trade dispute, growth was lowered to about 6 to 6.3 percent. Um, with this crisis, uh, with this COVID-19 situation, growth is now likely to come in at 1.5 percent for this year, before rebounding next year to about 4.5 and then eventually to 6 percent. Although US-China trade reduced, China trade surplus from US reduced, but China's trade surplus from European country, from ASEAN country increase. So the whole overall trade surplus is still maintained at a similar level as last year or 2018. Um, so um, if you look at the trade figure, uh, what affects China trade is not the trade war, it's the, it's the uh, disease, it's the virus. Because January, February, we run a trade deficit. China normally will not run trade, monthly trade deficit. Very rare, but in January, in February, we have trade deficit. But it's not due to trade war because trade war has been there for, for over two years. Uh, but it's due to the, 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 the virus. Although China may have found the light at the end of the tunnel, other countries are still struggling to get ahead of the coronavirus. The US has now overtaken China in terms of the number of cases. Europe and the rest of Asia are reeling from the onslaught of the disease. Stock markets remain volatile. Oil and gas prices have also fallen. Though the oil price crash was driven by Saudi-Russian rivalry, the outbreak has added to the gloomy scenario all around. At this point in time, um, it's not just stocks markets that's falling. Even protective assets such as US government bonds, uh, gold are falling. And this tells me there's a sign of forced selling because of margin calls, because of leverage in the systems. So it's indiscriminate selling of any asset classes that's happening right now. It has moved on from the stock markets. Uh, the impact of the virus, the disruption of supply chain to businesses and to people who has borrowed money uh, is clearly evident right now, today. For small business owners, recouping massive losses is a major challenge. They may take months to regain the position they were in before the crisis hit. I think for our industry, especially the local wafer fabs, we will be hit probably the, the next quarter or three months down the road um, when the rest of the industry get hit first. Um, and that will set us back probably half year to one year in terms of um, manufacturing, in terms of technology advancement, R&Ds and things like that. Um, that's, that's basically um, how I feel that this industry will be hit. Ivy Lai, the owner of a stage productions company in Hong Kong, is living on hope after the outbreak wiped out all gains she had made from her business. She's expecting the crisis to blow over in a couple of months, or else she might have to close shop. How soon will businesses return to normal? Will China and the rest of the world be able to bounce back from their worst economic nightmare? If so, when? At this point in time, the outlook looks rather grim. The disease is rampaging through Europe, the US, Southeast Asia, India and other nations. Most of them are under partial or complete lockdowns, disrupting lives and livelihoods of hundreds of millions of people. The International Monetary Fund has warned the global economy is heading for a recession. It may be as deep as the one in 2008 or worse. I think it's far worse because it's affecting much more of the economy as well. So, you know, at the moment you've got airlines basically who aren't flying, airlines will go bankrupt. 
that will mean airports will, will lose money. That means other parts of the economy are going to lose money. You're seeing entertainment and social activities come to zero. So bars, restaurants, pubs, clubs, cinemas, theatres, sports complexes, they're all going to be losing money and people will be losing their jobs. It's going to be far more far-reaching, I think, than the 2008 financial crisis. I think it will be worse, to be quite honest, because 2008, it was a severe economic disruption uh, and uh, a financial disruption uh, that uh, affected the real economy. Uh, but today, uh, the uncertainty is bigger to some extent because uh, it's something that is beyond the, the control of policymakers. I think the, the key consideration is going to be how long does the economic disruption from the coronavirus outbreak persist uh, and that will add to a number of factors which are building towards uh, a global recession. So it's not our base case at the moment but we see the risks certainly building there. The economic impact on a short-term basis could be as bad, if not worse, than what we saw in 2008. But in 2008, that was a situation that took four to five years to reverse because of the damage to the financial system. Um, this situation around, um, I highly, highly doubt that it will take us as long to recover from because of the fact that you know, the financial system is pretty much intact. Once you can get capital freely moving, again, when you can ease the liquidity constraints, when you can ease the dollar shortage in the system, you know, things will come back to an even keel. But all bets are off. If the march of COVID-19 is not halted and infection and death rates continue to rise. Some experts even wonder if there will be a second or a third wave of the virus. What does the future hold for other nations in the near to medium term? No one knows for now. I don't have a crystal ball. Um, but I do have a lot of historical extreme scenarios to learn from um, and learning from those crises that we've seen back to early 1900s, um, the final destination is clear. We have seen this sort of crises before. It feels like doomsday when you're in it, but the path eventually is a recovery. The way of getting there is unclear. Don't discount the fact that the normalisation can be very quick uh, uh, in that sense. And if it's very quick where the normalisation is concerned, then the hit, the global economic hit may not be as severe as what we are fearing.